Hello, everyone. Day is Thursday, April 11, 2024. This is the week and charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you girls and guys for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So, what are we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions have a lot to say about that. A lot of good to say about that, believe it or not. A lot of fear mongering out there, but I don't know. From where I sit, things look pretty good. Yeah, some sectors are rolling over here and there, but who cares? Other sectors or doing really well if you have any questions just punch them in i'll be happy to take a look at them uh, your favorite stock and crypto picks uh, if you want or i would suggest to hold off until we get the live chart so your questions don't get buried with the uh, the tickers i should say and put in one ticker at a time we'll do crypto first and then we'll get the stocks i'm going to continue my series on what it takes to be a trend following moron and i'm not going to get into that a whole lot tonight because there's so many other things i really want to get into we've had a longest period of landry light with a 30 ema since 1961 pretty exciting stuff there and just a lot going on methodology and action a lot of crypto trades good bad and indifferent and a new mystery chart a bunch of other stuff so there's lots of lot to cover tonight if you need to reach me here's all my contact information down here by the way i'm getting more active on twitter so slowly but surely so uh, please join me there too there's a slave screen as you know you lose money trading or as off to sum it up all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then and we'll revisit that in just one second all right as i've been saying quite a bit it's not about the crypto you're trading traders and not markets and right now as i've been saying quite a bit over the last couple of years i guess old guys rule when it comes to crypto because we know a little bit about psychology, we know a little bit about money management, and we know a little bit about technical analysis. And you don't really have to know a lot about all those things. You just have to know a little and actually apply it. Anyway, let's take a look at some of these trades. This one's still on. And the entry was here. 20% profit target was right there. Right now, I'm not analyzing the volatility of this market and setting profit targets like that. If you look at the trading service, which I'll show you the spreadsheet here in just one minute, we are adjusting to the volatility of the stocks. Right now, crypto is just so volatile. This stuff could move 20% in one afternoon, 20% in five minutes. So on a lot of these trades, it's just easier to put in a 20% a profit target. Now, something more mature like Bitcoin or whatever, you're probably going to have to adjust down to the volatility because that's not going to move 20% quite as fast, especially with all the derivatives out there on Bitcoin. But anyway, and by the way, I'm not betting the forum on this. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, crypto's dangerous. Well, it's no dangerous in any other market. In fact, I've done presentations. Uh, there's a, I'll put it in this week's newsletter, Better the Devil You Know, where I show that trading more volatile stocks is actually less risky using proper money management than trading less volatile stocks. And that'll make sense once you see the article. Anyway, so one thing I've been doing, as I've said ad nauseum, is a few years back, I'm a nerd. <laughs> like I said last week, I found a tree in the woods that's been laid over for a few years. It's got some nice little mushrooms spolting in it. And I, and I got a little winch and I'm dragging the trees out and I'm chopping them up and I built an oven and I'm baking them and I'm gonna build the dining room table out of it. Believe it or not, that's just the nerd I am. So, of course, I looked into crypto mining, but I was about 10 years too late on that. And as I've said quite a bit, if you, you could buy some of these miners for like 200 bucks, even new, and plug them in, and they'll lose about $10 a day, possibly more, depending on where you live. I guess if you had free, free electricity, they wouldn't, but uh, who has that? So, my mining technique was that, okay, I'm just going to leave 50 bucks here and there, or 25 bucks, whatever the case may be, in the native currency. So this FET, whatever the hell that is, I would keep $25 worth or $50 worth, whatever the case may be, of this native currency after the trade was said and done, provided, of course, it was profitable. Well, I quickly found out, or after about a year doing this, that a lot of these shit coins is the reason why they call shit coins, S-H-Y-T, because they all go to zero. But in the meantime, as a trader, you can make a lot of money. So my new experiment has been to mine, so to speak, $25 off. I'll take $25 off at the initial profit target. And then if this thing runs like 100% like this one did, I'll take another $25 off. And 
I just put those limit orders in place and I'm actually putting that money into Bitcoin. Now I know that I'm not a long-term investor and once I get to like one Bitcoin, then maybe I'll put some money management in place. But for now, just for S and G's, and I know you probably want to party with me, I thought it'd be fun to do that. And believe it or not, I don't want to brag or you know, knock a wood, come in. Uh, but this this stupid little technique, you know, $25 here and there has actually grown to about $3,000 at Bitcoin. That's better than the poke in the eye. That's, I hate to use the word free, but it's kind of like free Bitcoin, so to speak. The other thing too to remember with these things is you could have these huge spikes that happen and it spikes up, comes back down and you get nothing out of that by having a limit order in some cases like at 100%, and I'll show you one was 100% after 100%, you're able to get a little money off the table and if it keeps on going, who cares? You only took a little bit off, little crumbs here and there. But you can see this one ran 136% and the mark to market on this was 660 $16. By the way, I was explaining this to one of you guys, and I don't know the exact cycle number, but it seems like crypto is on about a two to three week cycle where it kind of goes crazy for a while straight up, and then it chops around, has deep corrections and all, and then it's rinse and repeat. So I find myself kind of getting in that cycle, not that I would use cycles in my investing or trading or whatever. But I find myself saying, okay, we must be in this choppy cycle now or down cycle. So I'm going to let things step out, so stop out, and then I'm going to sit on my hands for a little bit and wait for that next good cycle to occur. And as I've said quite a bit, these, these bull and bear market runs go so fast, it's just exacerbated. And that's the other great thing about trading crypto is you'll get a bull market and a bear market in one month. And, and that's the secret to trading. Now, longer term, stocks are my bread and butter, and they'll probably always be my bread and butter. But this crypto is a really great way to get your reps in. And again, this is nickel and dime stuff. And, and because it's it's not a tremendous amount of money, I'm able to act in somewhat of a flippant manner, as I'll explain to you in just one minute about what we get into being a trend following moron. Anyway, so I just want to show you that you don't have to be rich to go in and trade. You need a little bit more money, obviously, to trade stocks. But this crypto is a great way to get your reps in at a fairly painless way. Now it's 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 a bumpy ride, don't get me wrong, but it's it's a great way to get those reps in, get the money management in, get the pattern recognition in, trade the bull markets, make sure you stop out before the bear markets start, and so on and so forth. In stocks, you might have to wait 10 years for a bear market. In crypto, just wait a week. <laughs> anyway, so it was a whopping $666 investment. $398 came off because I took off half of that at the initial profit target of 20%. And the mark to market was 626. And there was $25 that came off at 100%. And if you add all that up, it's 58%. I don't know if the trade should the trade should be in here, but anyway, here's one that stopped out. You can see there's the parameters down there. Uh, again, in this case, usually I'll put about a thousand dollars into each one. And uh, I don't want to lose $1,000. In fact, a lot of times you'll see it's $25, $30, $40 or whatever loss. And then I just keep chipping away at it until I catch the next big thing. But you can see in this case, three or $54. So what probably happened was I probably didn't have any rum. I just had that remaining 350 bucks or whatever in the account. So I'll put it into this pair when it began to break out to new highs. Now, I'll show you the core methodology here in one second. But when they're all running, and they're not all running right now, by the way, but when they're really starting to take off, a few of them are, but when they really start to take off, and almost every one of them is up tremendously, sometimes you can just buy them as they're making new highs. It, it's kind of reminiscent of 1999, where you could just go in and, and use relative strength and buy the strongest stocks out there. And strength at least back then, to get more strength. And right now in crypto, that seems to be the, the, the case. And again, you're trading traders, not markets. So this is a very euphoric market. These are a bunch of young gunslingers, I'm guessing, type of traders. And as the market matures, that's some of these things are going to change, like the, the relative strength game, for instance. Anyway, so 20% profit target, whopping $34. Woohoo! You know, better than the poker eye, right? And this thing ran 55% and then stopped out. So $250, $254 invested, $211 coming off, $170 coming back to me. So that's $127. That's a 
six percent gain and the other thing you have to notice in this crypto is that was over a couple of weeks so if you annualize that that's going to be a, a tremendous number i know it's dangerous to annualize but sometimes it's important to annualize let's say you're you're trading and, and you're only let's say you're intraday trading stocks and you make two hundred dollars you're like oh it's only two hundred dollars well that's 50 grand a year that's better than the poker you eye. and then let's say you lose two hundred dollars one day it's like well you can't just sweep that under the rug because if you lose two hundred dollars every day again that's 50 grand a year now here's the core methodology this is what i'm saying so this was a, a newer coin or token i forget which is which but you can see it took off kind of like a, an IPO, a first deeper trace of an IPO. Took off, had a nice little pullback, very textbook in nature. So there's all the trades down there. You can see, and again, I'm not betting the form on this. In, in this particular case, a bunch of other pairs must have been running and I only had $457 that went into this, or it was done in another account that's even smaller than this uh, Coinbase account. Anyway, so 20%, a whopping $44, better than the eye, okay? And then I put in a mining order, so to speak, at 100% to take off $25. And I know it's kind of nickel and dime stuff, but I'm having a blast with this, and it's a lot of fun. And I think as the account grows, knock on wood, let's hope it keeps growing, then it might be a little bit harder to be so flippant. And again, we're going to get to that in just one second. But I thought it would be fun, and I know you still want to party with me, if I put in another order at 100% of 100%, and I took off another $25 there. So out of this silly little trade, I, I ended up putting $25 at 100% and another $25 at 100% of 100%, okay? So that's actually 400%, I think, is where I took that extra or 300% that $25 off. So that's 50 bucks going into Bitcoin. Let's see what happens. So anyway, we add all this up and it comes to $482, 105% return. And so far, so good. We'll see what happens. And the thing is, it's like, you're just taking little pieces off at these extreme amounts so if this thing keeps running, then who cares if you only have a little bit less than before? But if it shoots up 100% and comes right back in, at least you got a little piece of that off overnight. Now, um, these were, I think everything we just showed um, or follow-up trades. Last week, I was talking about this one. It's like, you can do it. You can see it triggered, and it was on its way to the IPT. Now, let's take a look what happened. Unfortunately, it came right back in. And that is one of the frustrating things about crypto is a lot of times they'll shoot up and they won't quite make it to that IPT before rolling right back over. And it happens, okay? So mother father. So that just turned into a $33 loss. And again, nickel and dime stuff here. But I just wanted to show you it's, it's sort of a, a live experiment, so to speak that you can trade crypto with a small amount of money. I would encourage you to, to trade crypto with a small amount of money to get your reps in. Longer term though, again, stocks is where the real money is, at least longer term. And who knows what crypto will be tomorrow or the next day. Now I did have an opening gap reversal in the silver stock yesterday. And you could use there are there are ways you can get gaps before before the open okay so there's software out there that'll help you find the gaps before the open and i do that every morning five minutes before the open i've got a little alarm set and when the alarm goes off i check the opening gaps and if something look in, looks interesting then i go for it ideally with these opening gap reversals as i talked about before you want a well-known company it's kind of just the opposite of what i'm looking for in a stock trade like we're, we're long stxs and aspi and kf and all these kind of crazy volatile inefficient stocks for the opening gap reversals as a general statement you want kind of a generic well-known uh not a generic but a well-known name and that's because you're going to have the most amount of players in it and it's going to help that opening gap reversal play out now ag is a silver stock it's fairly high in volume it doesn't really fit the the complete mold of of a um, 
I'm just going to pull it out one out the air, like the, the NVIDIA or something. Like NVIDIA would be a perfect opening gap reversal type of stock because you've got a lot of players in it. It would shake out a bunch of players and a bunch of players would rush back in and, and people who got knocked out might rush back in. And there's a lot of fun and games that happen. Market makers might take it down. And that's kind of the kind of the theory behind opening gap reversal is you have like an extreme gap down because the market maker has to buy the stock. So he just keeps lowering his bid to a point where, or he lowers his bid to a point where he's willing to buy it at such a low level that he knows he could flip it out higher later in the day. So in a way, or in a sense, you're trading on the same side as a market maker when you when you trade these open gap reversals. Anyway, just a thousand shares on this, a little bit bigger type of investment, so to speak, than Bitcoin. It, this is just in one account. But you could see that the buy was here when the stock began to reverse. And I'll show you the intraday chart in just one second. And I think I was using a half a point in this particular case. So got out of half a point. So that's uh, whatever that is. And then I got stopped out on a trailing stop. So this is what it looks like intraday. And again, there's the trades there. So the buy was actually here. And this is a five minute chart. Now, I know I've said this story a thousand times, but it, it just makes a lot of sense. It was kind of a minor epiphany for me. Uh, I try not to trade something like E-minis too much, although I do have a bit of affinity for late day zero DTE options in the E-minis. And so far, again, knock on what I've done okay with that. I haven't printed money. Uh, I'd say more often than not, I lose or scratch out. But that sets me up for the occasional home run. Anyway, e minis is a very efficient market, very difficult to trade. And it always amazes me, And as I've said before, when I meet a man on the street, like in the gym or whatever, they'll, they'll see my technical analysis tattoo. And you know, they, they kind of put two and two together and figure out that, that I trade. And they're like, yeah, I trade Forex and E-minis. I'm like, that's the two hardest markets in the world to trade. You'd be much better off trading those crazy shit coins than Forex or E-minis. But anyway, long story endless. I remember, and I wasn't very good at it, but I was trading E-minis and I was active every day because I'm here all day in front of these, however many screens it is, <laughs> and doing other work, uh, projects and presentations and such. And so it's kind of, as Dakota said, you put a you put a quote machine on your desk. It's like having a slot machine on, on your desk. You're gonna want to feed it. But anyway, long story endless. As I've said many times before, I noticed one week it was like Wednesday and I hadn't made a e mini trade yet. And I'm like, well, this is strange. That's as long as I've been, you know, doing this. This is the longest I've I've gone. And then I think Thursday came around, or whatever. And, Aha! There's a setup. And so I took it and I made money. And then the next week. I went two or three days without a trade and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And then finally it dawned on me, I had accidentally changed my charts from five minute charts to 15 minute charts. So I was no longer chasing the markets with all those zigs and zags. And since then I've changed over to 30 minute charts. Now I'm showing you a five minute chart here. So you understand the open and gap reversal, but I find on a 30 minute chart, it filters out a lot of the noise and I'm not as hyperactive by looking at a slightly longer chart. And I was kind of shocked a while back, many, well, a while back, 25 years ago, I knew a very active um, day trader. I was kind of shocked to find out that he uses 15 minute charts. I thought he'd be scalping on a one minute chart or something, but he's actually using a 15 minute chart. And not to digress too far, but the other thing that he did too, kind of like a Russian doll type of thing, and that's kind of exactly what I'm doing with the Russian doll, is he would take a daily bigger picture setup and he would actually look at that chart to make sure it looked good for weeks, months, and even longer. And then he'd go in and get a little day trade piece out. And that's kind of what I'm doing with the Russian doll. You'll take something like off the Landry list, which is my daily list of mostly pullback related stocks. And you go in for an intraday trade because you've got this bigger picture trend behind you followed by a pullback. But anyway, open a gap reversal. You want to wait for that market to look like the hook is in. Sometimes it'll it'll rally up, they come right back down, okay, a little fake out. But sometimes that second or third push higher is when you want to get in on these opening gap reversals. So the buy was there. And then I took profits. And I noticed here it says market. I think initially that was a limit order, but it was like one cent away from the IPT. 
And what was I using in this particular case? I think it was uh, about a half a point. And I figured it was close enough. I meant to grab my trading journal earlier and look it up. And I, if you have any questions, I certainly could do that. But I think it was like one cent higher. I didn't know it was going to take off in the next five minutes and go straight up. But I was concerned that it wasn't going to hit the IPT. And I figured, you know, better than the Pokemon, I should it not. And then a trailing stop stopped me out of the remainder. So it was, I think it was a half a point trailing stop. And of course, you give up a little bit of the trend in the end. And, and that's what being a trend following moron is all about. And I love these automated trailing stops because you don't have to think about it too much. Now, every now and then what I'll do, if I really think I've got a pretty good trend developing, I'll actually loosen up that automated trailing stop and let it go. Now, I don't use these on daily charts, automated trailing stops, that is, because we're trying to capture a much, much, much longer term trend, as you'll see in just one second. As I tweeted out earlier today, we've had the longest streak of Landry light, 111 days, 110 days. And that's the longest streak of Landry light above the 30 EMA since 1961. And I think that's pretty amazing. And you can see, this is the last run we just had. Now we are correcting a little bit, which is fine. And if you are getting close to 100 days or so, you need to kind of brace for a correction. I would not short a market because take a look at the NASDAQ made all-time highs today, believe it or not. And it corrected down to its 30 you make too. But that can only go back about 10 years in stock charts, but you could just, it just kind of gives you an idea of the magnitude of this last leg we were in. That was pretty serious leg. And now we're correcting a little bit, but that's fine. So that's a, it's kind of a, an interesting thing there. Now, uh, by the way, after, before 1961, or I'm sorry, uh, before 1962, the data was closed only. So I'm not I'm not sure how that affects the the Landry light. You might you might get a little bit more before um, 1962 because the the lows wouldn't be hit. It's open high low closes all the same bar. So I think this was the longest since 61 and before 61 it went to close only. And I could verify that before next show. But you can see just looking at 10 15 years of chart here or at least 10, you can see that this is a longer streak for the last 10 years. And again, you can go back 50 something, 60 something years or whatever it is. So I just thought that was kind of an interesting observation. I haven't fleshed a lot out from that just yet, other than when I did do a lot of this Landry Light study, studies on Landry Light, at least this longer term streaks like this, the market did tend to correct after you got to about 100 days, but I was using a different moving average than maybe a, a I don't know if it was a 20 EMA or what, but the 30 EMA right now is, is the one that I tend to use the most. Anyway, here's the mystery chart going into tomorrow. And you can see that the parameters down here, the entry is 10, stop is seven, IPT of 13. Now that's pretty volatile, but this stock is very, very, very volatile. You can see it made a bow tie to the upside. I suppose technically the bow tie trigger would be right here, but it's still sort of a bow tie looking because it's such a major transition. And you can see the bow tie went from downtrend proper order, the 10 simples less than the 20 exponential and the 20 exponentials less than the 30 exponential to uptrend proper order fairly quickly. And that gives the appearance of the bow tie. Anyway, also nice thrust from Lowe's, kind of first thrust looking, followed by a pullback. And, it could actually pull back more deeply, but in these first thrust type of moves, and I know this is a crazy 300% move from lows, but it's I think it's just getting started. I think it could double or triple from here. So we'll see what happens. Entries there, stop is down here, and the IPT is actually a little further away, whatever the parameters were in the spreadsheet. So here's the K and F, which actually hit new highs today. And we've been riding this trend for a long, long time. And we're going to come back to this one in just one second. So knock on wood again, banged out some new highs. And our stop is fairly liberal on here. I think we're down around 68 or so, whatever was in that spreadsheet. And that seems a little crazy, but the idea is to ride out some of these longer term corrections because now we're in longer term trend following mode. You or we don't go into a trade in longer term trend following mode because we'd have to have a stop about that wide 
and we wouldn't put on a whole lot of shares, we'd have to risk a lot. What we do instead is we go in and try to get that swing trade out by putting on a fairly sizable amount of shares based on the protective stop and 2% on the account value. If you need the spreadsheet, daylayer.com slash members dash resources, I always get it mixed up. But I, I pulled the spreadsheet out of the firewall or back from behind the firewall so you can download that. If you can figure out your entry and your stop, then the IPT and the share size and everything else based on your account value is calculated for you. Hey, if you're liking this video, and, and my apologies to my my friends that are live here tonight. Sorry about that, not getting that stream up and running. <laughs> I should give some I should give some of you guys my phone number and just call me uh, and say, Dave, your stream's not up. But anyway, if you're liking it, please like this video on YouTube. And if you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. And then also subscribe, and that helps me to bring more and more free content. Last week, I started talking about what it means to be a trend following moron. Like I said, last week, I got called a trend following moron by a very famous trader. At least I'm pretty sure it was him. And it really kind of messed with my mind for a while. And I was a little kind of bummed out, especially because I was very enthralled with this, with this individual. And he was kind of like a hero. And it's kind of like, it's, it's a great story and don't meet your heroes, right? Unless your hero's me, I'm a pretty cool guy. You know, we'll, I'm kind of a guy's guy. You know, we can drink beer and hang out, whatever. Anyway, or we can go, you can, go, you can help me uh, drag a tree out the woods. Now, once the, the TFM catches an elusive trend, and as I've said a thousand times, it's probably 20 years ago now or 15 years ago, I was speaking in Dallas. Peter Moffey invited me over there to speak to a technical analysis group. And I, I talked about the fact that it could be a little streaky. And he goes, well, you know, I use the word streaky. It makes it sound a little too elusive. And I thought about it quite a bit. This He gave me a lot of good constructive criticisms. Criticism, And um, I decided to leave that word streaky in there and even add the word elusive because it takes a while to catch a trend. And when you catch one, you need to ride that trend until the end, and that's days, weeks, months, or years, or maybe just hours. Who knows? But as you can see, somebody was asking me, like, how long are you hold the crypto? I'm like, as long as I can. And I've had a few that I've held for months, and that's probably the, the world record for me, or anyone for that matter. Now, one thing that I found this slide by accident tonight, and this is from Trading Full Circle, there's always a reason to exit a trade and rarely a reason to stay. I need to put trading full circle on sale. If you become a gold member of DaveLandry.com, you will get trading full circle for free within about a year, I think. Uh, so there is a delay in that. So you can get it free if you want to get a jump start on that. Shoot me an email, DaveLandry.com, and I'll, I'll work something out with you. Anyway, I found this slide again by accident. I'm looking for some other stuff for tonight's presentation. There's always a reason to exit the stock and rarely a uh, reason to stay. And as I've said quite a bit, the in fact, just recently somebody said, well, I follow this guru and he gets out of the market whenever it consolidates or gets choppy, whatever. And that's fine, but you're never going to catch a longer term trend if you always get out when there's a little adversity. And this one here, I remember sitting this thing for like two or three weeks and being kind of underwater thinking, is this thing ever going to go? But if you're following a system, you have to follow the system. The trend following moron has a system in place. He has his money management in place. He has to follow it because other people are counting on him to follow it, lead by example, right? But I remember it's pretty tough. And then finally it banged out that IPT. And then what happened? It died out forever. It just went sideways for what's this? One, two, three months nearly, okay? That's hard to hold a stock that long. And truth be told, I think it'd be tough for me if I didn't have this educational business to remind me to practice what I preach. It'd be really hard for me to sit in the stock for three months, like, oh, it's dead money. I gotta get out of this thing. But like, no, Dave, follow your plan. If you're telling everybody else to follow the plan, then you should follow it too. And that's another thing too, by the way, is hold yourself accountable. If you're gonna trade in a certain way, then be brave enough to involve somebody else with your trading and say, this is what I'm going to do, and this is where I did it. And as I've said before, I, 
one of my clients occasionally struggles with his trading, as we all do, by the way. And I said, what if you shared the service with your wife and told her you're going to follow this guy? And sometimes he's not so hot. And sometimes he is. But longer term, he does OK. And I'm going to follow the plan exactly. He said, would you, would you do that with your wife? He goes, no, 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 that would end the marriage. So he knew, and as Livermore said years ago, a speculator sometimes makes mistakes and knows he is making them. And as I often say, you know what you're doing wrong, you know what you're doing wrong, provided you have a little bit of experience. But anyway, as you can see, we let that stop widen out on this. It's not exactly the scale, but it's somewhere around 68 now. And as the market moves in our favor, we bring the stop up. When the stock goes sideways, we leave the stop where it is. And then we let it loosen back up. And that's so we can ride out a longer term trend. And once you get the initial profit target off, as I preach, then you're free rolling. That's a term that Charlie Kirk gave me after um, after I was spoke down at um, his uh, trader's retreat a few years back on the positions that have hit the initial profit target because technically barring overnight gaps of course the worst you could do is is stop out at break even and you have a chance for a home run and that trade i just showed you we put on way 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 last july now a lot of people say well dave you got we should get out of the market when the, when the you should get all your stocks when the market gets iffy it's like well if you're if you're trend following like the tfm 10 percent system where you you have a position on, like right now I have 100 Qs from 319.49, and for S and Gs, I put on that trade, I've been riding that thing since, uh, I forget when it triggered, last summer sometime. If you have a, a, a market timing system and you're in the, in the index or something, then by all means, get out. But we've had a lot of spills since last summer, and somehow that stock has survived that length of time and i hate to use the word hope but hopefully that will continue to happen so you have to be willing to stick it out and follow your plan longer term much easier said than done now if you're going to be a trend following moron you can't care about what the company does you can only care about making money and you almost it almost sounds a little selfish and in some ways maybe it is okay but you can't care if a company might be doing something in your eyes that is immoral or not environmentally friendly or whatever. And um, and I and I hate to I'm not picking this guy per se, but it just makes for such a good example. One of my clients, when this stock began to take off, this was a coal stock, and I was asking him about like how'd you do in ARLP, whatever. And he's like, Oh, I didn't take it because it's a coal stock and I don't believe in coal. It's like, okay, well, how you know, doesn't it take a lot of coal to fire up the electric cars? You know, <laughs> I don't know. And uh, that's not political, I think that's just a fact. But anyway, he didn't take the trade, and that's a bit of a bummer because he missed out on a really good trade. So I forget the exact numbers here, close to 20k. And that's on a one or a K hypothetical account. Now I did actually take these trades and I, I always, at least in one account, try to take them exactly as I recommend them with the same exact share size. So if somebody asks me about, hey, wh where'd you get filled on whatever, I can, I can let them know and I can show them a, a real fill and let them know. But anyway, so he didn't take it. So here's the thing, if you if you do wanna be I don't know if the word is altruistic, but if, if that's a word or that's the word, then just trade like a trader, okay? And let's say you make $20,000 at a coal company, well, go plant some trees or something or give that money to some environmental cause or whatever the case may be. You're, and, and I know I'm getting into morals and things like that and, and feelings and all, but think about it. Here's here's one way to kind of wrap your head around it because I might not like some of these companies and what they're doing either, but if you are paying me as a trader and a technician to find things that I think have potential, then I'm not I can't confuse the issue with facts and I have to eliminate those feelings about how I might feel about the company. Now, if you see a viable setup, you, you have to take it, okay? If everything fits, 
if it's uh, in a persistent trend or it's a hot IPO and it pulls back and it's made a pretty big run before pulling back, then you have to take it. You can't confuse the issue with facts like we talked about last week. And I remember with ASO, okay, it's like that's Academy Sports. I'm like a brick and mortar sports place. Are you kidding me? Who shops at Academy anymore when you have Amazon and all this other stuff? Well, I didn't realize that people would be buying kayaks and all kinds of sporting equipment because they were sick of being cooped up in the house. But this was one of our bigger winners. And it was a stock that I didn't want to buy. Now, I did not take the buy at D setup because in my IPO trading, I kind of like to have like, what's the story, fad or glory? I like it to be some kind of exciting stock that's going to, it, it doesn't have to, they don't have to be splitting the atom, right? It could be splitting the burrito or something. And, but if it's a hot stock for some reason, fad wise, or if it's kind of a glory type of thing, then I'll go in and take those pioneer setups and I might be buying as early as the close or near the close of day five. In this particular case, it's like, okay, Dave, it's a brick and mortar retailer. I'm not going to take the buy a D pattern. But as a good little trend following moron, I have to take a secondary setup. In other words, the first deep retracement, the first pullback. And that was the setup here. And I'm like, geez, a brick and mortar retailer. Well, here it goes. Let's just see what happens. And to my surprise, it worked out pretty good, as you can see. And again, that was on a hypothetical 100K account. But I should have that exact trade to show you. So Jeff says he still owns ARLP. Oh, how'd you ride out all zigs and zags? Yeah, I saw one of, I, I have to pull it up in the live charts. I saw it the other day. I'm like, wow, look at that thing. It's still doing pretty good. Now, if you're going to be a trend following moron, you have to learn how to be clinically dispassionate. And that's easier said than done. And one of my favorite quotes on being clinically dispassionate comes from Larry Williams. To make money as a trader, you have to not care. As soon as you start caring, you have an emotional attachment. It's counterintuitive. The more you care, the less you make. The more you're clinically dispassionate and less attached to your trades, the more you will make. It's really quite simple, but very hard to accept. And I'm not bragging because I'm not setting the world on fire, right? But that's why I am doing well in crypto right now because I don't give a shit, okay? You have to be really flippant, okay? You have to be prudent in your money management and prudent in your stock selection and all these other things, but once you place the trade, you have to follow along. So Jeff says, $2.70 a year in dividends, I account for that on my protective stops. Oh, that's cool. Sweet. Okay, so so what he's saying, and it's something that, that I didn't do because it's a it's a problem I never really had that much. Maybe once or twice I've done it before a little bit. So what he's saying is he's got $2.70 of dividends. So he's opened up that stop that that much a year to allow for a little movement because the stock is gonna is gonna come down. So that's a very good point, Jeff. And and you know, you learn something new every day. And uh you just reminded me of something that I that I need to be cognizant of because if I am in a longer term trend following mode and the stock throws off dividends, which is a rarity. I was shocked when all of a sudden this money appeared in my account. I'm like, what's this money from? You know. Um, anyway, so yeah, you, you do have to adjust your stops or you can adjust your stops down when that happens. But in order to make money as a trader, you have to learn how not to care. And, and, and this is a very powerful, if you don't walk away with anything tonight from me, take this from Larry Williams and Use it to your advantage or just try to do this. And, and again, it's easier said than done. Now, the trade volume moron knows that he has an edge, but once a trade is placed, he knows that it's completely out of his hands. And it's it's a very Socratic type of thing. The Socratic thinking is you know that you know nothing. So once you put that trade on, it's completely out of your hands. Think about all the variables that could happen. In fact, think about yourself as a microcosm. I tend to come into the office after I have a nice lunch or a nice breakfast or whatever, and I make trades I probably shouldn't do just because I'm feeling good. 
What does that have to do with the price of tea in China? What does that have to do with technical analysis, right? Because I'm seeing something that might not be there, and I think it's a good idea. I might get a margin call on my account, and I might have to liquidate some positions, okay? So that that rhyme or reasoning has nothing to do with the overall market. It's very hard to draw those connect those dots, okay? I might need money for taxes or for whatever, so I might have to take a chunk out of trading and I might have to sell some stocks to do that. People buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons, as Marion McClellan once said, Tom McClellan's mother. Some people buy when they have money, some people sell when they need money, and other people use more sophisticated methods. So everybody uses timing, so to speak. So there's all these different variables and, and, you know, shit happens, right? A lot of stuff can happen between now and then. And that's why I borrowed that line from Greg Morris, all predictions about the future and a lot of shit can happen between now and then. So again, when you have your edge, you know your edge is going to work over time, but you also don't know if it's going to work every time, obviously. If it worked every time, you'd never see my fat ass. And one of my members in my Facebook group was a little upset because it, it I was too, okay. <laughs> like a like a like I like I told him in the comments, it's like I I I I actually personally insulated my my walls very poorly, I might add, because I I like to drop F, I don't like to drop F bombs, but I do have a habit of dropping F bombs when I trade. Here's a uh in fact, uh, one of you guys, uh, it was Mike Peterson, sent me this F bomb here, and I, I don't drop it. I can't it's pretty pretty heavy. <laughs> yeah, drop an F-bomb, but don't let it ruin your life. And that's the other thing, too, and there's some things I'll flesh out over time, is uh, this one, obviously, the K&F turned into a nice winner, 81%, much better than the Pocony Eye, obviously. And these other ones in here having at the IPT, and this one here, so far, is failing miserable, miserably, but I have to follow the plan to see how it shakes out. And... It's okay to drop an F bomb or two, but try not to get too caught up in any one particular trade. Kind of goes back to the Larry Williams thing. You have to not care. And and believe me, that's pretty hard. And the other thing too, and 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 we're gonna get to all these things over time, but you have to realize is you know, it is streaky, like I said, and it is elusive, like I said. So we don't know which one of these stocks is to turn into a big winner. Now, this one worked out. And this one particular stock might save the portfolio for the next year, okay, or next six months or whatever the case may be. Slight exaggeration, but you kind of get the idea. And as I've said a thousand times, it, it, sometimes I'll be doing really great in the service, and we'll have three out of four winners, you know? And I'm like, well, did you get this one? Did you get this one? Did you get that one? They're like, no, but I took that turd you recommended, and I can't make any money. It's like, well, because you missed the ones that that took off. and and. And again, I don't make it sound elusive, but that's one of the things about trend following. In fact, the, the trend following moron thing is gonna is gonna mesh in with with a presentation in my head, and I've been writing a lot about about what it means to be a trend follower. And being a trend follower is tough, but it's the only way to make money trading. You have to capture a trend, as we discussed last week. So here's a crypto, and here's some of the these are longer term positions. Uh, let's see, this one we've been in since, or I've been in since March. Okay, that's a that's an eternity in crypto. Here we are in April. Anchor, I don't know if I showed this one earlier, but it hit the IPT. It's kind of chopping around. This one ran 200%. I think this was one that ran 200% before coming back in. And as you can see on some of these, I'm likely to stop out fairly soon because we're starting to get below that EMA which is a good reference point. This AIOZ, I'll probably have to put a hard stop in that one. That was starting to look a little ugly, so it might be time to think about failing on that. But you can see this one did run 100%, and that's crypto. That's what it's all about. Let's take a look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin is just kind of chopping around. We had this head and shoulders top, and I tweeted about that, and I talked about it in the Facebook group. And it looked like it was going to be negated. When a bearish pattern is negated, it becomes bullish, okay? And uh, I forget who wrote about it. It might have been Thorpe, and he called it the hound of the Baskervilles signal. And I remember 
way back in the day, I was trading coffee when I was trading commodities, and uh, it, it had made a head and shoulders, and then it took off from that head and shoulders, and it made a really good run. That was my first experience with the with the hound of the Baskervilles, as he calls it. But when a bearish pattern fails, it's a bullish thing. Anyway, so unfortunately it came back in, but it's kind of hanging in there for the most part. We're back above the 30 at least. Ethereum is kind of chopping around in here. It's lost a lot of steam, and Ethereum versus Bitcoin has not been doing well. So Bitcoin is outperforming Ethereum in here. Now let me just do a quick sort on these and see what's happening. See, here's one 59%. And you kind of want to buy them, and this is one I bought because it was going straight up. And look, once again, fairly close to that IPT. I don't want to make it look like it always works, but you can see, look, I got in, almost there. Now, if I sat around and watched this all day, maybe I could get out, but ain't nobody got time for that. So I just have a limit order in place and see what happens. But you do want to buy them uh, that if they're fairly liquid and if they're at the top of the, the bar, the top of the candle, so to speak. Anyway, I'm not seeing anything that's jumping out at me tonight, but we're kind of in that, this is kind of interesting. I don't know if it's liquid enough to trade, but maybe if it pulls back a little bit more, might be worth a shot. That's high. You guys know what they do? I have no idea. All right. Any questions on crypto? All right. Let's go ahead and shift gears and I'll go to, we'll go to stocks. And if you guys have any individual stock picks, I know we occasionally talk about stocks or quite often talk about stocks in Facebook. It's since I started the group, we we, we don't have many uh, questions about stocks, but if there's any, any stocks you want me to take a look at, please let me know. All right, let's start off with the P's, S&P 500. Nice little day today. Notice it came down and tagged that 30 EMA. It has lost a little steam in here, but I think that's okay. And again, this is the longest run, and, and I keep having to go back and look at it. It's kind of amazing that we went that long without touching that 30 EMA, so we were due for a bit of a correction. But you can see a little sideways in here, not enough to get excited about, and just enough, just enough to get all the fear mongers wild, uh, 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 riled up is what I'm trying to say. Get them all excited, get them calling tops, predict early and often, you know, that's what they do. And and that's good though. I love when a market has a lot of fear mongering to it because guess what? A lot of times that market will go on to close at all time highs. Look at that. We close at all time highs. Look how stealthy that is in the NASDAQ. A lot of people probably aren't realizing that the NASDAQ today, and it's hard to believe, closed at all time highs. And it was it's been pretty sideways as of late. But then look at that, up over one and a half percent, almost one and three quarters percent today. So good day. And the NASDAQ. Let's take a look at the Rusty. Eh, Rusty, same as it ever was. Just chop suey uh, down. Who was that? System of a dam. <laughs> down below the 30 EMA. The old one, CENX. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sold half IPT. You're still in the rest. Oh, my God, Mark. That's awesome. Yeah, I remember. I was looking at It's ironic. I was trying to remember. There was, um, I hope it's not the same guy, but because... Uh, <laughs> He's gonna he's gonna hate me after this week in charge. I hope I don't lose a client. Look, I'm not picking on you. It just makes for good examples. And he's a really smart guy too. Uh, but the the CNX, I seem to remember that we were a real choppy market. I think it'd gone like 50 days without recommending a new stock. And all my clients were like, "Why am I paying this guy to tell me to do nothing?" Well, because I wish somebody would have done the same thing for me. And that's what I'm doing. I don't know why I turned it into Kissinger in that. <laughs> But CENX, I think, was one of the stocks. He's like, yeah, I'm going to take a break. I don't see anything setting up for the foreseeable future. And neither did I. And because I had the educational business and the trading service, the analysis business, whatever you want to call it, I'm forced to do that analysis every day. I could have very easily had just taken some time off. And I often think, if I didn't have this trading service, would I work nearly as hard every day? I'm like, yeah, I don't think anything's going to set up. I'm not going to bother. And I'm not picking specifically on this one individual because it's happened so many times. So many big winners have come after no recommendations for a long time and people give up. And that's just damn trend following. It's like right when you 
give up, something big happens. It's kind of like a baseball game. You sit there and watch the thing for three hours. You go take a leak. <laughs> you, know, you see that it was a grand slam. And they ran, but you know, bases loaded. Like what? <laughs> anyway, I, I I don't know a lot about sports, so I hope it didn't screw that up. Uh, gold, the commodity. Look at that, banging out some new multi-year highs. These radio guys are finally right, but here's the thing. They're always like, buy gold, buy gold. It's like, well, why would they sell it to you if it's going higher? And now it's going higher. It's like, why would they sell it to you if it's going higher? So it's confusing. But gold looking pretty good. Take a look at GDX. This is the gold stocks. Finally getting its act together. It can be, gold could be wide and loose. All commodities could be kind of wide and loose. So you have to keep that in mind. And a lot of the gold stocks have a lot of overhead supply. But you can see based on this trend we're having now, a lot of that overhead supply is getting taken out. So we should see some gold, gold stocks setting up fairly soon. Silver's been on a tear too. Now silver's even more volatile than gold, which is next silver and gold. Burl eyes, <laughs> dating myself there. Look at that, uh, multi-year highs, I think on silver. So silver's looking pretty good. So we could see some setups in the precious metal stocks fairly soon. All in great in the world, take a look at healthcare beginning to implode in here. There's another index that's a little more cleaner. We'll take a look at it in one second. But that's a little bit of concern. Insurance got whacked pretty hard. I wouldn't call the end of the trend just yet in this one, but it has pulled back fairly deeply. Very important for it to stabilize soon. Durables have broken down a bit in here. Not that they're that tradable or you want to rush out and trade durables, but it's just an area that's breaking down a bit and non-durables also kind of breaking down. So all is great in the world, but in general, things are looking pretty good. Pot stocks are waking up and, and some people might be against the pot stocks. And why is it when I trade these stocks, I get so hungry? I don't know. But if you have a setup, then you have to take it. If you, what was that guy, Steve Winwood, whatever, you see a setup, you take it. I think that's how the song goes. Drugs, major drugs, another one of those questionable areas, okay? So we do have some areas here that are questionable. The good news is new areas are emerging and trends such as the metals and the energies. You can see RTH, that's retail, it's pulled back in here. So far it looks okay, it's just pulled back to right around that 30 EMA. Semiconductors for the most part hanging in there, decent day today, trying to rally out of this pullback in here. Or actually, they rallied out of the pullback and now trying to rally out of this consolidation. So that's pretty good. Bonds, not so hot. As you can see, downtrend or choppy downtrend remains intact there. So that's a little bit of concern. Home builders got a little whacked in here as of late. I wouldn't call them down and out just yet, but make sure you wait for an entry should you decide to do something there. Telecom, decent trend, right at all time high. So that's good. There's the energy, as you can see. Just off of all-time highs, pulling back a little bit. We could see some setups here fairly soon. Look at how persistent this run has been, and notice the acceleration. That usually doesn't happen in energies. These energies are acting like momentum, crazy momentum stocks. And I always forget his name, <laughs> but he gave a really good speech a while back. I think he works with the NASDAQ. And uh, he says value can become momentum, and momentum can become value. And if you never want to make any money in the world, buy a stock that's buy a not an ETF, buy a mutual fund that's like 50% value, 50% momentum, and you'll never make any money. Which was very interesting speech. Financials getting whacked in here a little bit, but so far just pulling back. So far looking okay. I think pullbacks are healthy. I know they're healthy, although they can be painful when you're long a market and it begins to pull back on you. But they are healthy. If markets just went straight up, eventually they would never be markets or markets would cease to exist. All right, individual stocks, let's shift gears here. And if you want me to take a look at any, I'll be happy to. John, the only thing I don't like about this one is notice that the, the trend, so to speak, is just a couple of days. I'd much rather see something in a little bit longer developed trend as opposed to like a breakout. Sometimes when you have just a few wide range bars like this up, it's like a kind of like the bottle rocket in nature we talked about in the stock selection course, where something just kind of takes off and then comes right back in. So I would pass on that. I mean, if you look at the like we were just looking at the energies or or any other these other stocks, notice or sectors, I should say, notice that the nice persistent and accelerating uptrend and instead of just one or two bars. So I would pass on it. Based on that, I think I think there's better stuff out there. 
John's our residence IPO guru in our Facebook group, Dave Landry Trend Traders. Dave Landry's Trend Traders. And he puts up a lot of good IPO stuff. And each week I think him for that. Very good contributor to the group. Thank you, John. Yeah, I'd hold off on that one. All right, any any more questions? Any more stocks you guys want me to look at? And again, I apologize to everybody on YouTube. I will have the recording up tomorrow. All right, while we're in impasse, I want to thank everybody for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, Dave at DaveLandry.com. Everybody have a great night. Everybody have a great weekend. And all you guys and girls on Facebook, I'll see you there tomorrow. Thank you so much. I made a trend. Be with you.